Well, good morning, everyone. I'm John O'Neill, pastor here at Grace Lutheran Church, along with Pastor Stan Jacobson, Pastor Jason Lucas, and Pastor Dick Lehman. So we're delighted to have you here, especially if you're a guest. Welcome. Uh, don't just love, I love having kids in worship. I just love having children come up with a children's sermon. It's just, I just love having kids in worship. It's, uh, it's really fun. At the last service, uh, I, I said, hey, kids, thanks for coming up. Great to see you. Nice to have you here this morning. Because one little kid turns around and says, nice to have you here too this morning. <laughs> I like that. I like that. So it was a Sunday school class, and the Sunday school teacher had challenged her children to go home that afternoon and take a little time and write a letter to God. And then they were to bring their letter to God to Sunday school the following Sunday. So one little boy wrote this. Dear God, we had a good time at church today. Wish you could have been there. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. That was the same little boy who turned to his classmate and said, Who is round John Virgin? <laughs> yeah. and of course, she answered, I think he was one of the 12 opossums. <laughs> So a Christmas story, it's, 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 a, it's a magnificent story, is it not? I mean, filled with tenderness and love and, and, and lights and candles and all that nice stuff. You know, sometimes we sort of wish God had been there. Yeah. You know something? The young bride-to-be of Joseph made no such mistake. She knew God was there. And she knew that God was being very active in her life. And her cousin Elizabeth knew it, too. Uh, she knew it as well. When she greeted Mary, she spoke with a loud voice that says, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And then, and then Mary has responded to Elizabeth with one of the most beautiful songs of praise that's ever been reported. Listen to the words again. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is His name. I love what Pastor Stan did last Sunday. He said, he said, as a pastor, how would I have counseled Mary if she would have come to me with her situation? I thought that was a really good question. And of course, as a pastor, you know, all of a sudden, you know, things go through your mind, and, and I have to admit, I probably would not have done a very good job with that. But I would like to suggest that, 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 that we would do well to spend a few moments with, with this charming young girl named Mary, wise beyond her years, and listen to what she might have to say to us. Her experience of Christ's birth, life, death, and resurrection was the most intimate of all. After all, she was his mother. If Mary were here this morning, what, what would she teach us? What would, what would Mary want us to know? What lessons would she give us from this mother of God's Messiah? Well, the first lesson, I think, might be a little surprising, I suspect. I, I, I think she would say to us, first of all, life is hard. I think that's what she'd say. Life is hard. The story of the pilgrimage to Bethlehem is, a, is kind of an enchanting one, but, but we pass over it so quickly. And, and, and as we tell the Christmas story, and, and you remember those great words, and in those days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to their own hometowns to be registered. Joseph went from the town of Nazareth to Galilee to Judea uh, to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was a descendant of the house of, uh, of, of David. And, and, and the family of David. And he went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. Mary should have known at that point that her life would be no picnic. Okay? Now that there are mothers here this morning that can tell harrowing stories about the birth of a child, even with modern advances in medical technology, there is that, that element of suspense until the actual time of delivery. But few mothers today have to spend the last few days of their pregnancy on the back of a donkey. And most, and most do better than a stable and the odors of cattle and sheep and the like. Mary should have had an omen at Jesus' birth that life would not be easy. This would be, not be the last journey under adverse circumstances. In Matthew's account of the Christmas story, Mary and Joseph and the new baby are forced to flee to Egypt with the baby 
to escape the wrath of Herod. So once again, once again, Mary and Joseph were, were on, uh, on the move, fleeing to protect, to protect the life of their son. Martin Luther, in commenting on this particular uh, gospel, says this, The artists give Mary a donkey. The gospels do not. Okay? Probably, Mary didn't have a donkey. She trudged over the hills in winter on foot, nursing her precious child and leaning heavily on her beloved Joseph for support. It was not until after Herod's death that the young family was allowed to return to Nazareth to their own home. You know, in a world filled with, with refugees, it would be well to remember that Jesus himself was once a refugee. He was a refugee. Well, the next dozen years or so were, were probably pretty good for, for Mary and Joseph. Probably pretty good ones. I mean, she and Joseph were never overly prosperous, but uh, but he was able to provide. And, and their oldest son, you know, he, Jesus was turning into a fine young man, and he was growing in stature and in favor with God and humanity, the Bible tells us. But then something happened to Joseph. We don't really know what. The Bible doesn't tell us. Life was... It was even more uncertain in those days than it is now. And Joseph, Joseph is never mentioned again anywhere in the Bible. In the harsh way that life deals with, with many people, Mary probably found herself a young widow. We can assume that. As the oldest son, Jesus, he would take Joseph's place in the carpenter shop, and that role he would fill until his, around his 30th birthday, and then he was baptized by John and began his public ministry. Joseph's loss would, of course, not be the last one for Mary. Because then she endured probably the most difficult, most grievous blow that could ever come upon a mother. She watched her beloved child die as a common criminal on the cross of Calvary. She watched that. Can you, can you imagine the, the pain and the agony as she, as she watched the unmerciful cruelty of death by crucifixion? Her own son. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? It's hard to imagine. And even there, even in all of that, who was Jesus thinking about but his mother? We read in the Gospel of John, it says this, Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And he said to his disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. I have no doubt, I have no doubt, that Mary, that Mary would have gladly taken her son's place on the cross that day. Even as Jesus took our place on the cross. Life is hard. Life is hard. Many of us are having a difficult time coping with life precisely because we think it ought to be easy. That's kind of what we think. Particularly at this time of year, we want our, our children's minds to be filled with visions of sugar plums and, and all those good things, and that's what we want desperately. But, you know, sometimes maybe the kindest words we can speak to our children are words such as these, you know, well, Mommy and Daddy just can't afford that this year. Sometimes those hard words have to be spoken. People who cope successfully with life are those who, who understand the importance of discipline and self-denial, who realize that life is a training school, and happiness, happiness is not a permanent state, but it's sort of an elusive quality best achieved in search of something higher. Life is hard. Just think about the, the, the suicides and drug-related deaths of the children of of some of America's best-known celebrities. And the comment is, but we gave them everything. Maybe that's the problem, you see. When life is easy, we don't learn to cope sometimes. Consider the story of one man, sick and real puny as a baby, and, and, and he remained frail and delicate all of his days. And later, as he became a pastor, his, his illnesses were so severe that he could no longer serve his growing congregation. 
Instead, he wrote them letters, letters filled with hope and good cheer. And even though his body was, was frail, his spirit was very strong. He complained once about the harsh and uncouth hymn texts of the day. And so someone challenged him, said, well, write a better one if you can. Right? Go ahead and write a better one. Well, he did. He wrote over 600 hymns, mostly hymns of praise. When he finally died in 1748, he left one of the most remarkable collections of hymns the world has ever known. His name was Isaac Watts. His contribution to the Christmas season, probably the most sung of all Christmas carols. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Isaac Watts. Could Isaac Watts have written so many beautiful hymns if his life had been easy? I don't know. Maybe. It's amazing, though, that how often people who, who have everything tend to lack spiritually. And those who struggle through life tend to have souls with both height and depth. Well, that's the first thing I think Mary would, would teach us. She would say that life is hard. But she would also say that even though life is hard, God is good. God is good. Mary was overwhelmed. She was overwhelmed that, that, that the God of all creation would have chosen her to be, to be this, this mother of the Messiah, this high honor. In her words, in her words, she said, He has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. And in, in Mary's mind, only a kind and loving and good God would surpass the wealthy and the powerful of this world to have a peasant girl bear his promised Messiah. There's, a, there's an ancient story of how the, the devil appeared in disguise to a, uh, as an angel of the light. He came as an angel of the light to, to a humble monk who was praying in his cell. I am the angel Gabriel, the devil said. I have come, I have been sent to you. But the monk escaped deception because of his humility. Thinking he was no better than any other of his brother monks, he simply said, see whether you were not sent to somebody else. I am not worthy to have an angel sent to me, well, unable to tempt the old man, the devil finally vanished. Now, no such deception occurred in Mary's situation. Still, her humility was very real. In her words, he has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. Now, you and I don't fall into the same, into God's plan in exactly the same way that Mary did, that's for sure. And yet each of us knows what it is to be humbled by God's concern for us. We don't deserve this kind of providential care. After all, who are we? Who are we that the, the God of the universe, the God of the galaxies, the God of the mega galaxies would be concerned and aware of our needs? Who are we? And yet, with a deep gratitude, we teach our children to bow their heads and pray, God is great. God is good. God is good. Not only because he, he chose a lowly girl of Nazareth, not only because he's aware of our personal needs, but because God keeps his promises. That is a major part of this great miracle in Mary's eyes. She says, He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham, and to his descendants forever. The coming of the Messiah was the fulfillment of a long-awaited promise. The people of Israel lived in anticipation of the fulfillment of that promise. A wealthy woman was caught up in the pursuit of the good life, that she uh, was very neglectful of her daughter, even when her little girl became bedridden, with an illness, uh, this mother left her in the care of a nurse and, and flew off for a European vacation. She felt that she could shower the girl with gifts to compensate for her lack of personal attention. While in Europe, she remembered her daughter's birthday, and she sent her this rare and beautiful vase. And when it arrived, the nurse brought it in, saying to the girl, Wasn't it thoughtful of your mother to remember you with this, this beautiful vase and refusing to even look at the present? The girl cried, Take it away! Take it away! And then as if her mother were in the room, she cheerfully exclaimed, Oh, mother, don't send me any more things. I have enough flowers and vases and pictures. Send me more. I want you. You. I want. That's what 
that's the cry of a helpless and hopeless humanity as it searches the heavens for God. We want you, God. We want you. Mary understood that the coming of the Messiah is the fulfillment of God's promise. Life is hard, but God is good. There might be one more thing that the Virgin Mary would share with us, and that's this. Life and love are always stronger than hatred and death. Mary's story is the oldest and most intimate story of all. It's a story that that has been duplicated millions of times throughout history. It's the story of a mother's love for her child. Even when he was a grown man with a ministry she could barely comprehend, he was still first and foremost her son. Mary's love for Jesus, however, is but a pale reflection of God's love for you and me. It's a pale reflection. That's why the star shines above the Christmas tree. It's the star of hope. It's the star of peace. But most surely of all, it's the star of God's love. Bruce Larson tells a, a beautiful and true Christmas story that appeared sometime back in the Denver Post. It was a week or so before Christmas, and a pastor came to a member of his congregation uh, and told him about a needy family facing a very bleak, bleak Christmas. Well, one young father decided to do something about that, and so he and his son set out the family pickup truck to cut down a fresh evergreen tree and take it to the family, uh, uh, this destitute family, to brighten up their Christmas. Well, they ran into a rock slide along the way, and a big boulder hit the truck, and the truck was badly damaged. Windshield was smashed, and although the father was not hurt, the young boy was cut by glass and was bleeding quite badly. Well, they tried to wave down passing motorists, and, and people, cars just continued to whiz by, and finally, one, one car stopped. The couple in the car took care of the injured boy, and they, they returned the two of them to their home and, and went on their way. The father and son never got the names of these two ministering angels that stopped to help. Well, a week went by, and the truck was repaired, the boy's injury was almost healed, and, and one Christmas Eve, the, the, the pastor asked the same man if he would deliver a basket of food and, and some toys uh, to the same family that he set out to help earlier. Well, he loaded up his truck, and they drove to the address that he was given to ring the doorbell. And who should answer the door but the very couple who had stopped to help them on the road just weeks before. Okay. Life does not always work out that neatly, of course. It just doesn't. But love works. Love works. Life works. Herod and Pilate are dead. Jesus is alive. I don't know what kind of holiday season you're having. I hope it's the best ever. I really do. I hope it's the best ever. But perhaps it has been a difficult time for you. If so, lean on these lessons from Mary's song. Life is hard, but God is good. And love and life will always be stronger than hate and death.